round before you are live. That, that was what I was thinking. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Great. So now I make wait. Um, you I'm going to make you host again. And then I'm going to mute myself because uh, I hand over to Omar, he is uh, the session chair. So I'm only, uh, I, I will keep quiet. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming and uh, looking forward to a great session. Thank you. Great. So let's see. I think everybody is present. So welcome everyone. Um, I think we start officially at four o'clock CET. Is that correct? No, we start at uh, 3.45 because André will first uh, introduce the, pre uh, the, pre the presentation awards for the posters. And then around four, Jackie starts with her keynote. Uh, okay, in that case, I had on that part on the agenda. Those are the conference announcements. Okay. Good. In that case, um, again, welcome everyone. A couple of things before we start with today's keynote, a couple of conference announcements, uh, which will be handled by uh, Andri. Um, then I'll officially announce our keynote speaker for today. Uh, and after the keynote, uh, I'll run a few of the poster and demo teasers uh, for the next session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Andrei Matvienko, and I was uh, a poster co-chair for uh, AIVR this year. And as you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 5.30, uh, we have other poster sessions in Mozilla Hubs where people can uh, walk around, talk to the presenters and um, enjoy the wonderful poster session in virtual reality. Um, but also every day we have best poster award uh, that uh, is decided by the member of juries and uh, co-chairs. And uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to announce the winners of uh, Tuesday poster sessions today. And um, well, one of our technical co-chairs, uh, Simon, he presented, he prepared and compiled a nice video of uh, yesterday's um, you know, experience and impressions of the poster session. And I will just share it with you uh, before I announce the um, winners of yesterday. So I will just quickly share my screen and make it small. I hope you can see it and I hope you also can hear it. Like on Tuesday, we were again impressed by the inventiveness of our Wednesday presenters. Together with the student volunteers, the two co-chairs of today's poster sessions had a hard time selecting the presentations that made the very best use of the virtual presentation space. <laughs> As always, there is only one winner, so let's move on to our top three. On the third spot, we would like to congratulate Yuji Chikagoshi, Yuki Uranishi, Jason Orlowski, Kiyomi Ito, and Haruba Takamura for their great work at presenting Rainbow Learner, 
lighting environment estimation from a structural color-based AR marker. You have nicely used the space, you have prepared a lot of images and videos, and you made great use of your visual media while presenting. Some points of improvement though, the items were quite big and required attendees to take a step back sometimes. Also, perhaps you could have added a bit more in-depth information for those that were interested. Overall though, great job. At the second place, we find study on pseudo-haptics during swimming motion in a virtual reality space by Hiroki Aoki. You used a very nice layout, you prepared many videos, and you created an excellent setting for audiences visiting in VR. Moreover, the juries mentioned that the title bar made them quickly and easily understand your method. One clear video summarizing the research was posted above the others, which was a nice touch. Some room for improvement. The juries missed the presenter today, and noted that though the videos were nice, they also became quite overwhelming after a while. Also, the text on the bottom video sometimes went by a little bit too quickly, but these are minor notes for an impressive presentation. Finally, we would like to present to you the winners of Wednesday's IEEE AI VR 2020 Best VR Presentation Award. Congratulations to Yu Yang Chang, Hang Ji Guo, Irania Garba Kumar, and Balakrishna Prabhakaran who presented a high-quality first-person rendering mixed reality gaming system for in-home settings. This was a wonderful presentation that truly immersed the juries. The authors made great use of the space and used both videos and images, as well as an overhanging banner. The presenters used depth instead of an explicit dome, which is an interesting and different approach from most other setups. This allowed attendees to walk through the presentation instead of showing everything at once, which was a nice experience. A minor point of improvement, some 3D models would have been a nice touch, as opposed to only showing planar images and videos. In general, though, you definitely deserve to win Wednesday's VR presentation awards. We are curious to see if anyone will be audacious enough to top this one. And on behalf of all poster session co-chairs, we wish you a great continuation of the conference and hope to see you soon. Yeah, so this was a um, nice summary video of our Wednesday experience in the poster session. And I just, again, on behalf of the juries and uh, co-chairs would like again to, con con to congratulate uh, Yuji Tsukatoshi, Yuki Yugarini, Jason Orlovsky, Kiyomi Ito in Haruo Takemura for their great work in presenting Rainbow Learning, Lighting Environment Estimation from the Structural Color-Based AR Maker for their third spot uh, in yesterday's um, uh, poster presentations. Then again, Congratulations for the second place study on pseudo haptics during swimming motion in the virtual reality space by Hiroki Aoki. And again, congratulations to the first uh, place of yesterday, which uh, uh, presented um, by uh, Ye Yen Chung, uh, Hung Ju Juo, Hiranya Garbra uh, Kumar, and Balakrishna Prabhap for their uh, presentation, high quality first person rendering mixed reality gaming system for in-home setting. So great job guys. And uh, thanks a lot for presenting your wonderful work with us, sharing it with, with the community. And uh, from, from our side, I would just would like to remind you that today is our last day for poster presentation, which is gonna be happening at uh, 5.30 Central European time. So uh, pass by, you know, to have a lovely, nice discussions with the presenters, give your feedback, and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. With this, uh, back to you, Omar. Great, thank you so much, uh, Andri. It was great to see uh, uh, that award uh, uh, session and seeing those great contributions. So at this point, um, I'm very happy to start uh, uh, the next keynote, the keynote of today, uh, and to officially introduce to you uh, Jacqueline Ford Mori from All These Worlds. Uh, Dr. Mori is widely known for, for using uh, technology such as VR to deliver meaningful experiences that uh, enrich people's lives. Uh, and already back, uh, dating back to 1990, uh, she developed multisensory techniques for VR that predictably elicit emotional responses from participants. For example, inventing a scent color that uh, could deliver aromas uh, to a participant within an immune serve experience. She is also active in social VR, social VR spaces, uh, and she's active through her company, All These Worlds, uh, where she has been bringing these techniques uh, uh, to social VR worlds with uh, mindfulness applications, storytelling, and stress relief. 
And together with uh, a smart information flow technology shift, uh, she created a virtual world ecosystem called uh, Ansible for the, for the NASA that was designed to uh, provide uh, psychological benefits for future astronaut, uh, astronauts designed to undertake extremely long isolated missions to Mars. Uh, so uh, very, very uh, future uh, forward looking. Uh, Dr. Moore's other uh, research interests include how avatars, identity and play in immersive spaces can positively affect our human nature. Um, today, she will be talking to us uh, on making room for AI in extended reality uh, and what we can expect. Uh, so she will discuss what will be the role of AI in our quickly evolving fields of extended reality, uh, from smart uh, and unplayable characters to intelligent tutors for training. Um, it's obvious that we can expect a wide range of AI applications to start populating our immersive creations. So what should we, we be considering both the benefits and pitfalls? That we will encounter as they become uh, commonplace. Um, Dr. Mori, uh, welcome so much. I would say that all these IEEE AI VR worlds are yours. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's morning here in Los Angeles. I'm going to uh, attempt the screen share function here. So give me just a second. And we're going to. Ooh, which one? Ah, no, I'm not seeing. My, what are you guys seeing? Because I'm not seeing. We're seeing um, your uh, presentation, but then in slide editing view, I guess. Yeah, now we see the main slide. The main slide. You're not seeing the presenter notes, though. No. Okay, we've we have, we have reached success. Um, so I, I changed the title of the talk just a little bit. Um, and it's still going to cover some of the same topics. But first of all, I, I want to thank you so much for inviting me to come here and share some thoughts with you at AIVR. I sincerely appreciate all the work that goes on behind the scenes to make something like this conference possible, especially globally. It's quite the challenge still. But being able to share knowledge like this is what makes us all smarter and advances the technology in ways that we can barely imagine. So thank you again to the organizers for inviting me to be here and to all of you for listening. So I've divided this talk into three main parts. Part one is a little bit about how AI will ultimately affect VR and all immersive technologies. Part two is how AI will ultimately affect our understanding of reality itself. And part three, which is a very short kind of uh, prediction, is how AI will ultimately affect the future and the evolution of humanity. So AI seems to be everywhere these days, infiltrating almost every aspect of our lives. So it's not somehow surprising that this is a whole conference devoted to AI and VR. And it's about time, I say. So much of what AI is and does is really under the radar for all but techno geeks like us. Um, but it is happening and it will have a profound effect on the future of humanity. You are some of the creators enabling that future, whatever it may be. Now, yesterday, Andrew Glasner gave a talk that covers very similar ground to mine. His talk, which I was not able to experience and hopefully many of you were, was entitled AI plus VR, The Kayfabe Life. Interesting title. However, Andrew and I were talking and he did give me a little insight as to what he covered. So like Andrew, I'm going to imagine a future where AI and VR technologies merge and are somehow indistinguishable from the physical reality that we experience today. I'll touch a bit towards the end on the thorny question of whether or not they are real or merely substitutions for real life. I may come to similar or very different conclusions than Andrew. But this is what's great about predicting the future. By the time we know what that future is, 
everyone has forgotten the keynote talks that people gave at the end of the year 2020. What is certain is that we are about to enter a very amazing and marvelous future, one where we will be able to control much of our reality. And much of that is through immersive media, AR, VR, XR, all the Rs, through these media becoming a much more prominent and useful and entertaining part of our lives. So why AI now? You know, how, how are we at this inflection point? I'll talk about some ways that AI is already infiltrating our immersive technologies. Some of you are probably the instigators of these developments, and I'm sure that's true. Now, time constraints won't let me cover everything, so I've only chosen a few examples here and there. If I leave out your work, it's certainly not because it's not important. While AI has progressed from the days of Eliza to now the dawn of Alexa, it still has vast distances to go before we ever have something even close to that much discussed, but still mysterious vision of artificial general intelligence or AGI. But in the meantime, we have narrow and increasingly useful techniques that are applying AI to a huge variety of tasks. And we can do this today because we have created veritable deluges of data in our global and unceasing use of computers. We could be drowning in this data, but instead we have developed methods to use that immense data in the service of machine learning, especially for deep learning networks based on varieties of neural net methods that make these techniques very robust. Someday soon, we may even build the holodeck, that mythical Star Trek concept that allowed anyone to escape into living a double life for a while with characters and situations every bit as real and nuanced as our primary physical reality. I want to focus this talk on some of the ways that today's AI is starting to contribute to making this grail of the holodeck not only possible, but very probable. So I wonder how many people here know what the holodeck is. Because if you do know, you're probably very old and wise. None of my students know what it is when I ask them. And for that age group that might be listening or diehard Star Trek fans, I will go over the concept a little bit here. Star Trek started as a TV series in the 1960s. Wow, ancient times. It didn't have a holodeck in the beginning. The idea of the holodeck was inspired by holographer and inventor Gene Dolgoff, whom Gene Roddenberry, the show's creator, met in 1973. This was about the time that Roddenberry was starting an animated version of Star Trek. And shortly thereafter, in one episode of the animated show called The Practical Joker, the idea of the holodeck emerged as the recreation room. But it was not until 1988, a decade or more later, in Star Trek The Next Generation, in an episode called The Big Goodbye, that the holodeck was allowed to be the star of the show's plot. In this episode, the holodeck is being used by Captain Jean-Luc Picard and his colleagues to play out a 1940s gangster story inspired by the Maltese Falcon film. The team actually gets trapped because of a problem within the simulation. So even in the distant future of the 24th century, we can still expect a few glitches if science fiction is correct. This is an original image of the holodeck from the TV series Star Trek Voyager. The holodeck is shown as a large room with black walls, floor and ceiling, 
gridded with widely spaced bright yellow lines. But what about making the real holodeck of the future instead of the sci-fi version? What would that take? This rendition of a future holodeck is by an artist named Jonathan Ranger, envisioning what it might look like. It doesn't go into details about the technology, but we'll do that a little here. The three important technologies that need to be developed are listed, uh, are listed on the next slide, and I'll go into a bit of detail about each of them. Granted, there's a lot of technology that must be invented and proven to make a true holodeck. Um, that being said, I've now worked at two prominent research labs over my career whose goals were always stated to be about enabling aspects of the holodeck as envisioned in that Star Trek universe. So here are the three big technologies I think are needed to make a true holodeck. The holodeck needs three things to make it so, as the captains often said to their number one. Some of these are really many, many years down the road, but some people are starting to work on them now. They're roughly divided into matter displays, intelligent characters and all the aspects of those, and in intelligent story creation, including generative narratives. So we'll start with matter displays, probably the, the, the longest shot in all the technologies needed. It's a very different kind of display technology than we know today. The background information from the Star Trek creators said that the holodeck worked on something called materialization, using technology similar to their 23rd century food replicators. And this was combined with projection beams that brought holographic humans to some sort of solid life in some mysterious way. They never said exactly how that could happen. But if you think of the displays as systems based on the manipulation of actual matter, then it starts to make sense. Now, we may not come up with a display technology based on matter instead of pixels and light for a long, long time to come, but maybe someday. I like to call this technology the nanomolecular real-time display where molecules are reconfigured on the fly to make solid matter objects like chairs you can sit on, tables you can put a drink on, vehicles, and food. So this is fairly far off, but it is certain that when this display happens, AI will be involved. And you never know. Just yesterday, Sony's new AI division, Sony AI, launched a new initiative dedicated to gastronomy research, AI for better recipes, cooking techniques, and a healthier approach to food. Also, earlier this year, Sony announced a new image sensor equipped with a logic chip dedicated to AI signal processing and able to output semantic metadata information, thus reducing the volume of data that has to be dealt with. So, Things like putting these features on a chip is definitely a direction that we will see more and more. Not to the matter display yet, but we can see that we're getting, we're getting to be thinking about it. So we may not have that display next year, but companies are starting to embrace a broader and a more human-centric concept and use for AI technology and looking ahead to that future. So the second thing the holodeck needs is characters that feel truly real. And in this regard, AI is making some good strides. We are now creating sophisticated virtual humans from influencers to training partners, from companions to teachers, from models to NPCs. These virtual humans or agents as they are sometimes known need to not only look believable, they must seem intelligent and very responsive to us. Now, we're getting pretty good at having virtual humans that look great due to many advances in graphics capture and generation 
and uh, rendering technologies. We have also taken these virtual humans and helped them be able to use and to understand our language by means of increasingly clever NLP algorithms that can select believable answers from statistical databases. And these answers seem plausible and don't have to be repeated. So it seems more natural in conversation. Some of these agents can even read our facial expressions or other sensor data and use that to exhibit believable nonverbal behaviors. Eventually, we would like virtual humans to be very nuanced and unpredictable, almost like real humans, maybe even better. We want them to have an intelligence that seems innate and that responds to us individually and can even form a rapport with us as we interact. I'll just mention one of the many research labs making good progress on this. The work being done at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies, where I worked for many years, has involved building believable virtual, virtual humans for 20 years now, from virtual patients to Holocaust survivors. They have so many virtual humans now, it's hard to keep track of them. Now, another use for virtual humans is in games. And games are often the place that kind of gets things started, that, that fosters the research that then can be put into more uh, widely accessible applications. We have latest games like Watchdog Legions that was just recently released. This has a never before seen gameplay innovation that allows you to recruit and play as anyone that you find in a future London. The gameplay is therefore not defined by a single character, but rather by the team that you recruit as you walk around London and the combined characteristics of that team. So you have to choose very wisely. And the NPCs in Watch Dogs Legion are much smarter than your average NPCs. Jada is just one of the many cool characters that you can pick for your team to be successful in Watchdog Legions. So I don't know how many of you have played this, but uh, it would be good research to go out and play this game for a while. Now, believable movements, the way these characters move in a virtual uh, immersive world is also critically important. And this is where we see a lot of AI research happening uh, in, in this group and uh, beyond. We are starting to use AI methods to synthesize very believable motion based on several advancements. And as one example of many I could cite, Holden, Kimura, and Sato's research from 2017 demonstrates a human character animation system that uses AI to better navigate all kinds of terrains. They start with movement captured in a motion capture studio and then use that data with a face function neural network that smooths out what would otherwise be rough turns and movements. Such data-driven motion synthesis can make motion better as the database of captured motions gets even larger it will continue to improve. So actually imagine in the future, if all the movement data from all humans that are participating in VR in immersive spaces is saved and added to that database, this forms an ever increasing corpus for future deep learning. At SIGGRAPH Asia last year, Kamura and Sato, along with Stark and Zhang, took the work a step beyond the terrain interactions to implement interactions with chairs and other seen objects in their neural state machine for character scene interactions. This is another great advancement and allows us to have more natural um, interactions within the scene itself. And these are just two of the many examples I could have used. Again, this is an area of extreme interest with many, many researchers making significant steps, large and small, to make character motion better without it having to be done by tedious hand animation. 
where it can be generated on the fly and appear natural and very believable. Now with characters, I still wanna hold out for what I call the personality variable or maybe a set of them. I wanna dial in those characters or maybe even myself as perhaps timid in one situation and bold in some other, cranky when I'm tired and exuberant when I'm celebrating something. So the characters are pretty much the key because they are the social glue that is going to make things feel real for us. Now, the third thing, the third feature that the holodeck of the future would have is AI being used in the story or experience end of immersive media. And these are called many things, generative narratives, um, you know, reactive uh, situations, all kinds of things have been applied to this particular aspect. So we'll look at a couple of examples here. Here we can imagine reactive, unique, and instantaneously customizable story experiences, never twice the same. This is where the participants, the AI characters, the scenes and the events are all tightly coupled and work together to make sense. And this is a huge area ripe for research. We are starting to see some advances here, too many to name. And they're all kind of baby steps, but they're all getting us closer to this holy grail. Uh, an example of a first step in this is work by Disney Research and Rutgers, who have created a system that can take text-based scripts and from them generate a storyboard animation with videos and moving parts. Now, they themselves admit that this system has a long way to go and a great deal more data is needed to make it more robust so it can actually pull from more uh, assets to make the storyboard, the animated storyboard. But given those better stores of data and the right AI and deep learning mechanisms, such a system has the potential to streamline at least the first phase of production. And now to jump to something even further along, uh, someone who has been thinking about the lines of democratized and adaptive story experience for some years is a friend of mine named Ann Greenberg, whose work is more entrepreneurial and less about research. So I thought it was important to put an entrepreneurial uh, aspect in here because while research is coming up with the new ideas, someone's got to put that in play to make something uh, usable for the general public. So Ann Greenberg's company is called Entertainment AI. It's aimed at merging human and machine creativity to engage new generations in a future form of storytelling. This will be something that makes the storytelling we know today seem very um, quaint in some ways. Now, Anne is previously known for creating or co-founding the company GraceNote, which is one of the largest entertainment data companies and now owned by Nielsen. The entertainment industry, because of things like GraceNote, has vast amounts of data that can be put to work training AIs. Anne envisions AI in the service of wholly new story frameworks that shift from a singular to a collaborative viewpoint with many, many people collectively forming the story. This approach creates a foundation for new forms of narrative and she calls this infinite story, where people grow stories rather than tell them. So they're not pre-authored, they happen on the fly. Central to entertainment AI is something called the smart script, which is a patented format system that automates media generation. What the smart script does is micronizes all elements of a story using micro metadata so that each and every element is contextualized, the who, the what, the where, the when, the how. And these micro 
data points can be infinitely recombined into dynamic narratives that change based on each participant and their actions. The system uses artificial intelligence in a number of ways to quantify and to synchronize performances, to create these increasingly responsive narratives, and actually even to compensate participants for their participation. So this becomes something where all of the people creating it are co-authors and can share in the benefits of having created that system, even to the point of being paid for that. That's a very different new future that involves things like blockchain and, um, and other aspects we don't have time to go into here. But I wanted to give you that as a, a kind of a glimpse to what might be coming, you know, this, these systems of AI that allow us to create in a democratized way new forms of storytelling. All right, so part two. This is a little bit about how AI will affect our sense of what reality is. As I said earlier, we are entering a very amazing and a marvelous future, I think. One where we will be able to control so much of our reality and also interact seamlessly with many other forms of reality. What this means is that we have to shift our perceptions of what the term reality even means. I say this talk is about how AI will affect VR and all immersive technologies, but truly it's more about how AI is going to change the very nature of reality as we know it, because AI will change the fabric of reality. Even today, the reality we experience is changing meaning in the light of this moment in time this dawn of XR and immersive technologies combined with AI. We, we are seeing a reality that 20 years ago we could barely imagine. And these new realities are created through code, artistry and novel thinking to expand or enhance what we generally perceive to be our commonly understood human reality. Now, Today, we may understand these new realities as simply extensions of or enhancements to our normal everyday life. However, as our brains and our beings perceive these extended realities through all of our sensory apparatus, then they start to become part and parcel of how we know and understand our world and are living in it. They serve to form new neural pathways in our minds they will change us. Our grandchildren may see the reality we have known in this 21st century as strange and maybe even quaint, just like how we view what the Middle Ages must have been like before cars and phones and computers and all the things we kind of take for granted today. Immersive technologies combined with AI are going to extend our normal physical reality we understand right now what it means to go outside and enjoy nature because we have experienced that reality hundreds of times. Or what it means to share a hug because again, our human body has done this innumerable times. Our real experiences, whether they are provided by immersive technologies and AI or by a physical world will still be our reality when everything is integrated. As we experience these future realities, they will become part and parcel of how we understand the world we live in, the very expanded world we live in. Each development of human history, each expansion of our capabilities from the development of language to the invention of the printing press to the invention of uh, automated factories, these forever alter the reality that we as humans know and understand. And humans will evolve into a being that understands and interacts with new realities in a fundamentally different way than their ancestors did. So while this is exciting, and I can't wait to see it, at least the beginnings of it, it's not without issues. So, 
Yesterday, I know Andrew Glasner mentioned a few of the issues that we may encounter with these new technologies in his keynote. Now, there are far too many to do more than a brief mention of them here. Most of them concern all that data that we will be generating as we use these systems. Who owns it? Who controls it? There are movements now to have individuals own their data. And then for companies that want to use it, they have to actually compensate them for that data. It's coming. It's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, kind of a long way off because of uh, the embedded systems we have today that are kind of flipped the other way. Who owns your voice, your body motions, your haptic reactions, your smell responses? even your neuro signals. Should we be at least ask for permission to use or compensated somehow for the use of such data? Even if the goal is, is really to train new AI systems, which seems like a very um, purposeful and, uh, and worthy goal. You know, the holodeck was supposed to be a safe alternative to reality. But many of the Star Trek shows featured the holodeck gone bad in, in the plots. And the same could probably and will happen to users of future immersive AI-driven systems. So whose fault would a bad outcome be in these immersive situations? Are we gonna have to sign away rights to blame someone else for actions that we may or may not control? Will there have to be warnings on these experiences? Related to this is the question of, are such systems hackable? And to what end? What's the worst thing that could happen if a system is hacked? So this begs the question, what is the responsibility of the creators of these technologies, not only the users of them? especially if the technologies go rogue or surpass us and no longer need us or even understand us. What is the ethical framework that will govern these systems that creators will be required to follow perhaps? It's really good to see that ethics is being considered at this conference. It should be considered at every single conference on these topics. We are already experiencing the rise of deep fakes and virtual stars who can be paid less and never have to take a sick day. Will these constructs obsolete humans someday? We don't know. We do know that there are certainly more issues that will arise as these systems become more deeply ingrained into every aspect of our lives. I truly want to believe that we will figure out these issues and overall things will be mostly positive but I've always been somewhat of a Pollyanna. So the third part of this talk and probably the shortest is AI affecting the future of humanity. I'm not sure I can predict this just yet. Predictions are notoriously vague and inaccurate as disruptions that we could not foresee will throw monkey wrenches or silver linings into the best laid plans and predictions. As we have all seen firsthand in this year of the pandemic, who'd have guessed? What might this increasing use of AI beget? Will it be Kurzweil and others' vision of the singularity? 2045 is the year, folks, so stay tuned. Or will humans still be able to play some role in the future that might involve the so-called AI overlords? Can we hope for any control? Or will we have created our own demise? Will they place, replace us entirely? Stephen Hawking said, AI will be either the best or the worst thing that ever happened to humanity. I'm hoping for a positive outcome, maybe something in the middle where such technologies will enhance and even make us more human, a new and evolved form of human with new and bountiful realities. So 
in closing, I want to say in the last analysis, the best guarantee that a thing should happen is that it appears to us as vitally necessary. And that is what AI enhancing our immersive media is. It appears to be vitally necessary at this moment in time. So thank you for listening. And we have time for some questions or comments if anybody has some. So I'm gonna end the slideshow and we will see if any questions arise. So thank you. So thank you, Dr. Mori, uh, for this uh, very inspiring and uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, view into, uh, into our future. Um, to those uh, attending, you can uh, uh, use the chat window uh, to ask your questions. I will be able to see them and forward them uh, to Dr. Mori. So by all means, use those, uh, use chat window to uh, provide Dr. Mori with your questions. I think everybody's uh, saturated. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly understand that, you know, these conferences do so much to fill our heads with wonderful ideas that by the third or fourth day, it's, um, it's all you can do to keep focusing because there's so many th thoughts swirling around in your head. Absolutely, I recognize that fully. Um, while awaiting maybe some questions from uh, the viewers or the attendees, I certainly have uh, a few questions of my uh, of myself uh, as being one that, that certainly grew up uh, with the holodeck and the perspective, uh, uh, future perspective that are provided uh, in that sense, very triggered by your story. And, and what I liked is that you uh, very quickly broke it down in those three, aspect, three aspects. So material displays, believable virtual characters, and, and aspects of the storyline, gen uh, generative storylines. And of those three, do you have a few on which you think is the most dominant one uh, uh, that will help in making that, that sort of virtual or alternate reality uh, really believable? I think they have to work in connection with each other. I mean. Certainly we have very believable uh, situations that we can put ourselves in now without a matter display. So maybe we don't need that. You know, it's how it affects our brain. But if you have a great interactive story uh, situation, but you've got crappy characters, <laughs> you're not gonna be there. You know, and it's, it's all about removing the barriers to criticizing the situation you're in. So we want things to feel natural. If they don't feel natural, it affects our sense of presence in those worlds. Uh, so all of the technologies have to work in, in what I call a gestalt. So that what you feel that you are in is um, without question, a believable space with believable characters. Uh, the first virtual reality worlds didn't have characters because it was not technically possible at that time to really render characters inside the virtual reality experiences. And nonetheless, people felt like they had gone somewhere. Um, so, you know, you don't need everything, but as you add stuff, it ups the, um, the ante for what has to be and feel and look and appear right for our brains to accept it as something believable. So I, I, I can't pick one. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that you point at the necess necessity of, of developments working together towards creating that gestalt because that means that, that next to researchers really delving into specific aspects of, of one of those three lines, there's also a clear need for people looking at the developments in those three lines together and, and coming with a view of how they will work together. And, and um, that maybe re will require quite different skills and, and assets in our researchers. And, uh, do you see that happening as well in, in um, you know, our, our, our educational systems that, that they allow 
for for education of, of people with those skills? Um, and I think we need to advance our educational systems to support that kind of thinking. Um, you know, things, discoveries are uh, often started in isolation and without the thought of to where they're going to fit into the, the whole social human ecosystem. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, some of the, some of the detailed research, like I spoke of, um, getting the humans to move better is a first step to what will ultimately be how they are put into these situations where they will be used. So you, you want both, you want the detail oriented, but when the technology gets to a certain level of readiness, that's when you need to start working with other uh, people to bring it all together. Um, I work at the XPRIZE Foundation as a technical advisor. And one of the projects that um, I've been on for the last two years is called the ANA Avatar Project. And this is a competition to come up with a physical robot that an operator can um, teleport into from a distance, right? And, and actually feel like they are in a remote location interacting with either the scene or the, like a disaster relief situation or another human at that end, like your grandmother. And say you wanna give your grandmother a physical hug. You can have a physical robot that can help do that as your avatar. Now, that kind of system doesn't really exist yet, although people are working on it. And what the X Prize tends to do is encourage the different aspects of what that technology will need, encourage teams to start working together. So we started with like 100 teams and, and many of them have merged. We're down to in the 70s now. Um, and we, we expect maybe half of those will come to the semifinals in-person physical testing. So we don't, we don't have an X prize for the holodeck yet. We don't have, uh, you know, we've, we've had it for the tricorder, which is interesting um, from Star Trek. Uh, some of this happens naturally just because of the interests of the people in creating the future. But some of it can benefit from being um, encouraged by things like the X prize or other competitions or other challenges that are put out there for people working on diverse aspects of what will be an integrated technology someday. Excellent. So uh, the, 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 the system engineering view, system development view, and then system over systems, things come together. Yeah, and uh, absolutely uh, the XPRIZE avatar uh, contest is for one that uh, we will definitely uh, keep an eye on. Um, in the meantime, checking some, no, not, not questions there. Uh, luckily, I have, a, I have a list if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to do one thing really quickly, which is put my shade down because Dawn has arrived in LA and I'm totally yeah. walking out. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go ahead and start your question. And, uh, okay, yeah. There. If, uh, <laughs> and, and I didn't mind the spotlight, but I can fully recognize how it was uh, really the, the bright of day uh, coming there. Uh, you, you pointed at, at uh, some interesting aspects of you know this the, the virtual world and how um, uh, the characters inhibiting that world basically provide the social glue of our social experiences. But you also sketched a future. Uh, you, you refer to singularity, uh, where maybe the other, the alternative might also be true, that, that we humans entering that world will provide the social glue for those virtual characters. And, and Star Trek obviously points at those characters initially NPC, but then becoming aware and becoming, well, uh, alive, if you, if you would like to use that word. Are, are we ready for that, for, for such an important role towards our potential future virtual uh, co-humans? It's certainly a different reality that we would have to get used to. I mean, if we really create systems that um, allow the evolution of these digital constructs to the point where they start to become sentient and they start to have their own life, you know, then I think that's pretty far-fetched, but a lot of people believe that is going to happen, that our mind children will become something that are, is every bit as valid and, and viable as a human being. 
Um, and so then we have other questions, you know, what rights do we give them? Or if the tables get flipped, what rights do they give us? Um, that's a, a future that it could or could not happen. Uh, I, I tend to believe personally that there's a spark there that between sentience and full um, entity viability that is really nebulous and porous and we haven't started to define that yet. Um, I like to think humans are more complex than anything we can create, but that may not be the case. And uh, the, so we have to wait and see how that plays out and what, how we, how we deal with it, if it does play out, how we, how we make that part of uh, the world and the, the reality that we experience without having it totally ruin this human experience. I want it to make it better, not earn it. So, you know, I, I don't know how that's going to happen. This is way past, I think, my lifespan. But uh, some someone down the future is going to have to deal with this. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, this, this also touches upon some of the elements, other elements of, of ethics and, and privacy that you mentioned when it comes to the data associated to these experiences. Um, and, and, and the care we need to take uh, to think about what rights do we associate to the data. I mean, at some point, the data might be sufficient to create somewhat of a viable digital alternative for people. And, and what does that mean? So that, that, that's going to be an interesting aspect. Um, it, something else that I really found uh, uh, very interesting that you mentioned is, is what, what tools or what um, uh, limits do we set the creators of these systems uh, so or what guidelines do we give them such that we can take all of this ethics, privacy, data management into account? And, and is, is that something that, that you're seeing today? If you look at the technological development, sometimes going really rapidly, do you feel that we have sufficient uh, uh, guidelines for those developments? I think we're trying to make them. And that's really encouraging that almost every group from IEEE to you know, to other computing groups, to um, to people in the XR community, everybody is thinking about ethics. So it's really a topic that can no longer be ignored. Um, you know, maybe we didn't think about it when we created the atomic bomb, but with the technologies we're creating today, we we have that as one of the first steps of how do we think about this. We may not know all of the problems that this technology is going to put forward for us. But, we, but just by having ethics at the table from day one, we are, we are far ahead of, of where we were in developing technologies, even at the beginning of the 21st century or 20th century when we, we started factories and look what that did, you know, for putting children to work in unhuman conditions. And um, we didn't have ethics, you know, for that kind of business uh, thinking back then. But now everywhere you turn, there is ethics being considered and that is a huge step for uh, for humanity. Excellent. I, uh, I fully agree that it's uh, very good that it's uh, at least uh, uh, on the mind of everybody uh, uh, involved in this. And uh, let's hope it, uh, it brings us much further. Um, I think at this point, uh, we're almost ready to uh, uh, wrap up the session. Um, I'd like to thank you a lot for this, uh, again, thought-provoking uh, talk, uh, giving us so much uh, interesting glimpses uh, uh, into the future of where AI and VR uh, combine uh, based on all the experience you have. So thank you so much. Yeah, let's go make the holodeck. <laughs> <laughs> let's go make it, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you again for, for uh, you know, giving me this forum and I do hope it did provoke some uh, new thinking in people. Ab absolutely, I'm, I'm certain of it. Um, I have an, a, a second duty to perform and that is uh, uh, prepare people for the upcoming poster session. And the way to do so is by showing you some teaser videos of all the work that will be presented in the next session. Uh, which means that I will uh, start sharing my screen and uh, uh, show you those videos.
So let me start with the very first one and see if that all goes well. We could use some AI in Zoom. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That will be uh, definitely uh, helpful. Okay. You should be seeing. Okay. Hopefully you see the title annotation tool for precise emotion ground truth label acquisition while watching 360 fear videos, which is work by uh, Beijing Institute of Technology, uh, Centrum for Wiskunde and Informatica here in Amsterdam and Delft University of Technology. So here it goes. So that's at least one of the videos you'll be, a, be able to see. Uh, let me also check if the sound is coming through properly. Um, Okay, and that will be video number one. This is number two, sculpting in the new uh, Vitri VR amphitheater. Okay, let me start the third video. And then again, these are just the teaser videos for the posters uh, and demos that you will be able to experience uh, when we wrap up this section. Well, that teaser certainly already triggered some uh, interest. Be interested to see what is happening there.
So that was number four, hand tracking on uh, mobile devices. We move on to number five. So that's work on AI assisted VR training. We move on to number six. So great pilot study on vehicle painting, in context of VR learning environments. And moving on to the final teaser. So some compelling work that includes things like blockchain and smart contracts. So those were the eight teaser videos for the upcoming session. So let me go back to, let's see, that's not the one. So having shared these uh, uh, teaser videos, I think it's time to, uh, to wrap up this session. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mori again for presenting such a uh, thought-provoking keynote. Um, and with that, uh, we wrap up uh, this particular keynote session and I hope you enjoy the remainder of the conference and the upcoming poster share. Yeah, thank you, Omar, for sharing the session. Thank you also for uh, Jackie and Andre to 
present the poster awards and all the others who contributed. Um, I could not hear any audio for the video teasers. Uh, by the time I realized it, it was too late to do anything about it. So I'm not sure if it was just on my side or for everyone, if it was for everyone, our apologies. But it's actually a good thing because it should encourage you even more to go to the process sessions because then you can also hear and talk to the people directly. So it's all like uh, great work. So uh, please go to the process session or go to the parallel workshop, uh, March workshop on uh, modeling virtual humans is continuing in parallel now in the next session. Good. And uh, I think we're at the end. So thanks again to everyone. Uh, Jackie, thanks a lot for getting up so early and for this really inspiring talk. Really happy that we had you here as a keynote speaker. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Good. Then, uh, Xianju, could you please stop the video, uh, the YouTube live stream?